Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends in Jesus and Mary, today we speak about a very serious, a very important, uh, also very powerful and beautiful message of Our Lady. It's the message of Our Lady of Mount Carmel at Garabandal in Spain from the years of 1961 to 1965. Now, much has been written, much has been commented. Uh, there's much on the internet about Garabandal. Uh, in particular, the focus on the warning. But uh, there is a larger perspective. Uh, there's facts that need to be articulated regarding the Garabandal effect so as to put the reference of the warning in proper context. Now, some of you may have not even heard of the warning, which is fine. That's what we're going to cover in this program. But we're going to cover the facts regarding Garabandal as coming from the official uh, documents uh, from the diaries, from the testimonies, uh, from the objective, scientific, uh, events surrounding the Garabandal event. So let's start with uh, two critical points. Number one, what is the position of the church on Garabandal now? So once again, these are reported apparitions from 1961 to 1965 to four Spanish children in a mountain hamlet, uh, Garabandal, uh, in, a, in the mountainous region of Spain. Four visionaries, Three of the girls are 12 years old. One girl is 11. Uh, the principal visionary is Conchita. And then you have Yashinta, Mary Loli, uh, and Mary Cruz, uh, the last being uh, 11 years old. So what is the present church status of Garabandal? Now, this could take hours to go through in detail. So I'm going to summarize this. Uh, just to give you an example of some of the complexity, you had the first uh, one of the early bishops, not technically the first bishop, but early bishop, Bishop Pukal, say uh, this is uh, not authentic, and he had a very brief commission that refused the testimony of hundreds of doctors uh, and of people who uh, reported cures uh, and even theologians uh, and came up with a negative decision. You then had a later bishop, Bishop Duvall, saying uh, that he believed in the apparitions and he was going and he uh, established a new commission for that. Then you have later bishops uh, saying, I agree with the unanimous decision of my predecessors. Well, that's obviously uh, impossible because you have one very much against, you have very much one very much for, and then you have a series of bishops uh, you know, speaking uh, in terms of unanimity. So there's great potential confusion regarding the status of Garabandal. So let's go to Rome. Let's go to Cardinal Ratzinger in a letter of 1992 to a bishop who was asking for the intercession of the, at that time, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And Cardinal Ratzinger writes in a November 28th a 1992 letter back to the bishop, he said that we do not, the, the, the congregation now, what we now call the dicastery, we do not want to engage in this directly, but we suggest that if you feel the need, you could reiterate the non constant status of Garabandal, that the supernatural character is not clear. So the non constant status. Uh, just so we're very clear, is not constate non. Constate non is where a bishop condemns an apparition. Cardinal Ratzinger is confirming that that's not the situation of Garabandal. The situation is that the supernatural character is not clear. Uh, that's a quote uh, from uh, several of the bishop's statements, but Cardinal Ratzinger is saying uh, it's a non constate. He uses that technical language, fortunately, uh, that the supernatural uh, character has not yet been established. That means that the, the question of Garabandal remains open. Uh, and several bishops, including uh, Bishop Osoro, who would later become the Archbishop of Madrid, said, I'm open to all information on Garabandal. I've seen authentic conversions coming forth from Garabandal, and that he would hope for uh, a 
further investigation by later predecessors. He was promoted and so moved out of the Diocese of Santander to, uh, to uh, Madrid. So all that says the Garibandal issue is still an open question. Uh, let me read two quotes regarding people you know. First of all, a gentleman named Padre Pio, now St. Pio of Petrocina, he said, quote, O blessed girls of Garibandal, they don't believe in you or in your conversations with the white lady. They will believe when it is too late. Second quote from Mother Teresa, quote, From the beginning, I felt that the events of Garibandal were authentic. So, um, and as we go through some of the phenomena of Garibandal, What's very clear, uh, and quite frankly, a, a direct contradiction to uh, the, that statement of Bishop uh, Pukal, the earlier bishop, who basically said there's a natural explanation for all of this, um, who was tragically killed in a car accident uh, soon after uh, that, uh, that statement. Um, there's clearly things that cannot be explained only by nature. The, there, there's clearly at least preternatural, that is, beyond nature, and I would hold supernatural events that go from Garibandal, which means what? It's either from heaven or from hell. But if you're talking about prayer and penance, especially for the hierarchy and for priesthood, uh, in light of a chastisement, uh, that only serves heaven. That doesn't serve hell. So uh, let's go through uh, some of the dimensions. And before we get into the message itself, I want to make a second clarification point that I think is very important. Garibandal must be examined on its own. That is to say, be very careful of other alleged messages that have somewhat piggybacked or somewhat attached themselves to the Garibandal message, especially the message regarding the warning. Uh, I could just say it uh, frankly and directly. There are many false apparitions right now being promulgated on the internet by dubious websites who are not being obedient to church authority, including statements by bishops uh, condemning some of these events uh, as official final statements, uh, and that there are claiming, as part of their alleged message, uh, reference to the Garib Mandal warning. Uh, they will sometimes add things like, well, the warning will happen, then you'll have six weeks to decide what you're going to do, and then you'll be led to a refuge and your guardian angel. This is all, first of all, not part of the Garibandal message. Secondly, it's wrong. It's erroneous speculation that has caused hundreds of thousands of people uh, undue uh, confusion and stress and, and further crosses in their life when they're seeking, you know, the peace of Our Lady. So I say again, uh, I mean, I... You know, I want to make reference to Matthew 7, uh, 15 through 20, where Jesus talks about beware of false prophets because they do have sheep's clothing, but they're wolves. And I think of this image of Our Lady's faithful remnant, uh, Our Lady's, uh, you know, uh, force or her, her, her enoim, her, her, her little ones who, who want to be true to her messages, but are being taken out of the proper sheepfold of, of those faithful to Our Lady by these wolves of false prophets. Um, and to those who think they're having messages, but you've had church authority officially say that this is not of God, please obey. Because the message of Jesus says those false trees will be thrown into the fires. Freeze, trees that do not <clears throat> bear authentic fruit will be thrown into the fire. It's a strong statement. Um, and if one says, well, <clears throat> look, I, uh, I'm so clear that mine is authentic and the bishop has to be wrong, well then, obey him anyway, because that's what Padre Pio did. That's what happens with the message of divine mercy. If, if it's really of God, if it's really of God, even if there's a temporary delay based on an imprudent or an, an, an erroneous decision by a local authority, God will vindicate it, Our Lady will vindicate it, Submit and obey to the church's authority. That's where safety lies, ultimately. So, having said that, let's get to the Garibandal message. And again, it's a four-year 
uh, series, which I only want to outline in terms of giving you the heart of the message uh, and the, the principal events. So it begins on June 18th, 1961. These four children uh, are, again, in this mountain town, uh, not unlike uh, kind of a Fatima or a Lourdes uh, surroundings. And an angel uh, resplendent with beauty appears to them. This angel would later be identified as St. Michael the Archangel. This starts a series of uh, angelic apparitions, again, very similar to what happens at Fatima in 1916. And um, the townspeople start to realize that these children are coming together. Uh, they're, they're praying the rosary. They're in ecstasy. And um, this, this phenomena starts in terms of something supernatural is happening here. Well, on June 24th, <clears throat> 1916, 61, June 24th, interestingly, the first apparition day of uh, the Medjugorje apparitions, which I certainly hold to be completely authentic. Uh, the angel appears, but there is an, a mysterious inscription. And on the foot, towards the, towards the, the foot, the base of the angelic apparition, uh, are the following images. The words, you must, dot, 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 and then a space, and then the number 18 in Roman numerals, and then the number 1961 in Roman numerals. Why, why so much detail on this? Because you're gonna see this is a remarkable underscoring of the importance of what's gonna be the October 18th, 1961 message. Now, the children don't know Latin uh, numbers. They don't know Roman, uh, Roman numbers. And, and so they make reference to this. They, they, they tell the priest what they've seen, but they have no idea what this means. And again, these angelic apparitions continue. Well, on July 1st of 1961, the angel comes back and says, I've come, I'm paraphrasing now, I've come to tell you that tomorrow the Blessed Virgin Mary will appear to you. So July 2nd, 1961 is the first Marian apparition. That's why July 2nd is typically seen as the, the anniversary of the Garabandal uh, apparitions. And Our Lady appears with the Christ child and two angels. Uh, the visionaries, principally Conchita, who is clearly the primary visionary, uh, makes reference to the angel they saw before, which will be seen to be St. Michael the Archangel, and another angel that looks very much like him, uh, who most believed to be St. Gabriel. Well, this would initiate four years of hundreds of apparitions. Uh, in one of the most endearing manifestations of maternal love, Our Lady will spend hours with the children, speaking to them about their families. Uh, they, they will uh, sing songs. Uh, the children will be allowed to hold the Christ child on occasion when uh, when Our Lady brings uh, Jesus. But it's really this, this remarkable maternal rapport that Our Lady builds with the children. Along with this, at one point, Our Lady predicts that there would be, the children would deny her apparitions for a brief period. And the, the, of course, the seers don't understand how that could be possible. But this continues in, in a remarkable fashion. And you start to have in August of 1961 what are called Yamadas, uh, the interior calls. So that regardless where the, where the children are in the village, they would get three interior calls with growing intensity to go to the place of the apparitions, which is typically the place uh, called the Pines. Okay. And so the children would get warnings that they were supposed to go, and then it would become stronger. And then sometimes at a supernatural speed, uh, grown men uh, couldn't keep up with them. They would, and this is very similar to the phenomena of, of what's called walking ecstasy at Medjugorje as well. The children would go uh, to the place of the apparition, and Our Lady would have, uh, again, these extraordinary uh, times, sometimes more brief, uh, sometimes uh, far more extended, again, hours at, at certain times. Remember, again, uh, in terms of precedence of church uh, authentic apparitions, uh, this was very true at Cabejo, Rwanda also, where 
there was an apparition uh, up to four or five hours. Uh, this is Our Lady establishing the relationship so that the children can do the task they are called to do. Well, the phenomena would continue, again, in, in a rather remarkable way. You would have uh, literally hundreds of doctors over this period of time uh, going and, oh, well, at least a at least hundred doctors, but I believe it's hundreds, uh, that would examine the children and the vast majority said, you simply cannot explain by natural cause what's happening to these children. For example, what? Well, for example, during the apparitions, uh, they would pierce the shoulder of the children with a needle. Uh, this was the old medieval way of weeding out false uh, visionaries. Uh, perhaps we could, well, I was going to say we could use some needles today, but not directly the needles, but some better way of weeding out uh, you know, those who sadly, either by diabolical origins or mental illness, are reporting things that are not true and causing great hysterica, hysterical, uh, hysteria, but also great dist distraction from the real Marian messages. So uh, sometimes uh, visitors would actually use cigarettes and put their, cig their, their lit cigarettes into the shoulders of the visionaries. Again, they wouldn't move. They were clearly outside of time-space reality. Uh, the children also would take on an extraordinary weight during the time of the apparition, during the time of the ecstasy, where two grown men would come and try to lift them, and they, and they couldn't. And as soon as the apparitions were over, you know, they would pick them up. These little girls were like 80 pounds, uh, which is a fascinating image because it, it, both Plato and C.S. Lewis talk about how heaven is more real than earth, not less real, uh, at least in terms of Plato with, with the, you know, the images of ultimate goodness. But C.S. Lewis, obviously, in, in the Christian version, uh, in his great novels like The Great Divorce and whatnot, that heaven has more being than us because that's where we're supposed to be going. Well, you then had occasions, documented occasions of levitations where even during times of examination by the doctors, the children would levitate uh, several inches above the, the bench or the position where they were standing uh, for the sake of the examination. Uh, you, you had one of the most extraordinary phenomena take place. And again, this would go on for, for significant times, you know, 50, 60, 70. I mean, there was over, uh, there were hundreds of visions throughout the whole thing. But with these walking ecstasies and these other events were also multiform. And this was the event of where the children would take blessed objects or take objects and rosaries and assuming they're blessed, but crucifixes, but also wedding rings and bring them to Our Lady so Our Lady could bless them or kiss them. Now, let, let's get this scenario you know, accurate. There were hundreds, there was between 300 and 5,000 people for many of these events. And they would put whatever object they would want blessed on a table. Now, particular but not exclusive to the kids at Garabandal, they would have their eyes open throughout the time of ecstasy, which is typical, but they'd also be looking straight up. They would not be looking directly in front of them, be looking straight up. They would have these walking ecstasies when they would be going over a very rocky terrain. Um, Garabandal is not unlike places like, again, uh, uh, Fatima and Medjugorje, in terms of the rocky nature of, of the terrain, they would never stumble. Uh, they would never fall. And when, for example, let's use the case of wedding rings, uh, after the wedding rings were, were blessed by Our Lady, while the children were looking straight up, they would return it to the right couple amidst hundreds of people. Okay. So, are we getting how supernatural that is? How, how that cannot possibly be done on a single occasion looking up, let alone repeatedly over and over? So they would bring the wedding rings to Our Lady. Our Lady would kiss them. They would return them to the right people, but also all the individual religious objects. This rosary to that person, that crucifix to that person. It, it, 
it, it appears that Our Lady was so generous with these miraculous, these supernatural events, because indeed, later, people would deny this. People would come up with, with uh, reasons that uh, this was all a hoax. Even, sadly, that second bishop saying this was only a game uh, by, by, by little girls. And so Our Lady really redoubled the supernatural character of these things uh, to underscore. On one occasion, there were, it looked like a type of uh, makeup compact and there was some hesitation of whether this should be brought to Our Lady. And the, the, the children asked Our Lady. Our Lady said, yes, bring this to me because this was the container of, th th because this belonged to my son. And after the ecstasy, when returning this, this container to the people that brought it, uh, it was revealed that during a time of Spanish persecution, that was used as a Eucharistic pix possible for the children to know. There were also occasions, by the way, when uh, rings were brought to be blessed and they were turned unblessed because, in fact, the couple were not married. So these were simply, this is this, 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 this uh, knowledge and let alone knowing the identity is absolutely positively uh, supernatural. So now this leads us to October of 1961. In October of 1961, Our Lady reveals to Conchita the great miracle. Okay. Now, we're going to have to specify the great miracle from what Conchita called the mini miracle, the, 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 the little miracle, uh, uh, miracura in, uh, in, in, the, in the dialect. The great miracle was a reference of Our Lady that at a given time in Garabandal, at the place of the apparitions, there would be a historic miracle that would lead, number one, to the healing of anyone that was present, to the conversion of anyone that was present, and thirdly, if there were any unbelievers present, they would be believers because of the stature of this miracle. Uh, it was also specified that the miracle would be for 15 minutes during which these healings would take place, but there also would be a permanent sign present at that location in Garabandal in the Pines that would last until the end of time, but which would also be uh, the cause of great conversion for the faithful. So that's the miracle and the sign dimensions uh, of Garabandal. Conchita was given the date. Now the, the other children also reve re revealed, uh, excuse me, uh, received a revelation of the great miracle, but Conchita alone was given the date of when this will happen. Uh, and it was specified that it will happen on a Thursday, uh, somewhere uh, within the months of March, April, and May. It will happen at 8.30. Uh, and, and Conchita is to reveal the date eight days before the event for those who want to come and receive these graces. Now, just for perspective, uh, Conchita is in her 70s uh, presently. So any idea that this is, you know, for a couple generations uh, in the future uh, does not sink with the facts. This is a grace for us now. Now, it's also very important to realize that there will be a warning in relation to the miracle. So, the, the, the miracle again will happen within a year before, it could be a day, it could be 365 days before the great miracle, there will be a supernatural warning. And that's, again, why this the context of the full message of Garibaldi is so important, because people have isolated the warning uh, and talk so much about that outside of the context of the miracle. But that's not the Garibaldi message. The warning prepares for the miracle. So what is the warning? According to the visionaries, the warning is 
an external event, something that will happen in the sky. Conchita refers to it as something like the collision of two stars, at which time every single human being will receive a God-given illumination of their individual conscience and an awareness of that which they have done, which is not in conformity with God's will, with God's love. And that's why it's called the, uh, the aviso in Spanish, the warning or the illumination of conscience. Now, this has to be seen, however challenging it will be for us to see our sins and the effects of our sins. Uh, this is ultimately for conversion, not for fear. This is not, by the way, outside of the history of Catholic mystical tradition. For example, St. Teresa of Avila uh, had an experience of an awareness that God gave to her of the demons with a place prepared for her in virtue of her sins if it wasn't for God's mercy and redemption. St. John Vianney uh, prayed that he have a full awareness of the full weight of his sins and then later uh, told to close confidence, don't ever ask for this. Don't ask for an awareness because it, it's so hard to bear what justice for our sins would be. Now remember, we don't have just justice. We have mercy because of our infinitely sweet, sacred heart of Jesus for, for the mercy that he brings us. But it's good for us also, you know, both Teresa of uh, Avila and St. John Vianney said, however challenging, difficult it was to know this, it was a grace for the rest of their lives. So this would be illumination of conscience that we all receive that helps us prepare to appreciate the great miracle and the grace of conversion. Okay. So we have miracle announced by Conchita eight days before the event. We have, within a year before that, a supernatural warning, something that starts external, and then is a God-given readout of our souls. Uh, one has to think of people like an abortion physician uh, who will realize in one moment that they've, if they've been a physician for 20, 25 years, they've probably killed a small town. Uh, but better they get this shock and the ability to convert than to continue doing this, this grave offense against God and man, killing God's innocent children in the womb. The sign, again, a permanent sign of this miracle that will happen at Garabandal. Now, all of this has to be seen unless we cherry pick the message, unless we do false redaction, has to be seen in light of a great chastisement that will befall humanity if there's not major conversion. Now, I made reference to the June 24th, 1981 message where the angel appeared, but there was a date, okay, in, 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 in Roman numerals. Obviously, it was something the kids couldn't understand. They just related to the priest, and it started with, you must. Well, also, in October of 1961, the children uh, were told to convey that a very important message would be relayed on October 18th, 1961. And there's a lot of different, of course, speculation about what this would be. Some thought it might be the solar miracle, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a very difficult rainy day and sleet and hard to get to Garabandal for, for the, you know, the, the, the agricultural people of the region. Uh, but this was the message that was given on October 18th, 1961, which was anticipated by St. Michael on June 24th, 1961. And the, actually, in fact, Our Lady asked the parish priest to read this message, but unfortunately, the parish priest chose not to obey Our Lady, and so the children had to read it themselves. And this is the message, quote, We must make many sacrifices, perform much penance, and visit the Blessed Sacrament frequently. But first, we must live, excuse me, we must lead good lives. If we do not, a chastisement will befall us. The cup is already filling up, and if we do not change, a very great chastisement will come upon us. Now, 
that message did not thrill the people who had made significant sacrifice to show up on October 18th. Look, chastisement messages are never fun, right? They're just absolutely necessary. It's not fun for parents to discipline their children. Uh, that would be very dangerous if that became something fun, but it's absolutely necessary. Uh, and so one has to think of a chastisement as a type of spank from the divine Abba. Uh, and I use that ex uh, example not to lessen the potentiality of this, especially if we keep this message girded between messages like Fatima, where Our Lady states that various nations will be annihilated. Okay, that has not yet happened, and that's an essential part of the Fatima message. Or Akita Japan, another approved apparition, where Our Lady has said, fire will fall from the sky, uh, wiping out a great part of humanity, that the good would envy the dead. Why does she say this? Because we need to know it for a new examination of conscience, not waiting for the warning, but doing our own examination of conscience and also examining where's our generosity level. You know, um, Do we put entertainment in higher priority than prayer? Do we put exercise in higher priority than prayer? I'm not speaking of exercise. I'm talking about a hierarchy of values. Uh, prayer takes care our, of our eternal life. Exercise takes care of our temporal life. Body, soul, very, very legitimate combination, but in terms of priority, spiritual always has to be first. So where are our priorities? And, and that's this call uh, to really make our own examination of conscience and uh, a call for greater generosity in terms of prayer, rosary, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, frequent confession. Uh, before we get God's examination of conscience, we want to be as, as prepared as we can on our own. Well, there are two great public messages of Garib Madal. I've just read you the first one. That's the October 18, 1961 message. The final one will be uh, the message in 1965. And I'm going to hold up uh, reading that one. That will be on June 18th, which is also the, the anniversary of the beginning of the phenomena at, at Garib Madal. Because in between the first and last, there was what was called... Uh, by Conchita, the little miracle. So after October 18th, 1961, quite frankly, people were disappointed. They called it the dark days of Garibandal. Why? Because that wasn't the type of message they wanted. They wanted some type of miraculous thing. So the children started asking Our Lady and St. Michael the Archangel, could you please do a miracle so the people will return to a more fervent belief. And it had been the case that whenever the parish priest could not offer mass, daily mass at the parish church, San Sebastian, that St. Michael would bring the visionaries Holy Communion. And once again, we, we know that that took place at Fatima in the 1960, early 1917 apparitions 1916, 16, uh, early 1917, uh, angelic apparitions by St. Michael, where he also gave them communions of reparation. Uh, and, you know, I, I have to interject here. With all the supernature, with all the phenomena, with all this, we can always find some reason to doubt. And, and unfortunately, some priests said, well, this can't happen because angels can't consecrate the Eucharist. Well, of course they can't consecrate the Eucharist. Neither can Eucharistic ministers. It doesn't mean they can't bring the Eucharist. And when the children brought that objection uh, to the children, to, uh, brought that objection to St. Michael, St. Michael said, uh, it is taken from tabernacles throughout the world. And so as the children kept asking for some type of sign, finally, uh, St. Michael granted a sign, and this was on June 22nd of 1962, uh, again, what Lucia, oh, sorry, what Lucia, what the Conchita called the milagruco, which means the little miracle. She called it a mini miracle. And St. Michael said that he would bring Holy Communion in a public manifestation. And he named the date that it would be on July uh, 18th and 19th, uh, 1962. 
And so on that day, and in fact, it's kind of amusing that Conchita would say to her mom and the priest, well, yeah, it's a mini miracle. It's a little miracle. And she said, well, yeah, because you know the great miracle is great, but this is kind of a little miracle. Um, well, in fact, on the evening of July 19th at 1.30 a.m., surrounded by hundreds of people, and let me just specify, videotaped on an 8-millimeter camera, Lucia, I'm sorry, sorry, Conchita kneels, extends her tongue, and her tongue is extended for a little while, and all of a sudden, to the gasp of everyone, the Eucharist appears on her tongue. Let me just say again, it's videotaped. There's there's hundreds of witnesses. So you got to go again to these objections and saying, how much more do we want? How much more do we need? How much more should we expect for Our Lady in Heaven to guarantee that this is a supernatural event? Let's keep the hierarchy of value correct with this. Well, this all leads to the final, the second public message. This is now June 18th of 1965. Once again, it's a strong message. Uh, we should expect that from Our Lady because uh, we're in perilous times. Uh, it's never without faith and never without hope, but we should have a realism of the fact that the greater part of humanity is exhibiting a great arrogance. Uh, you know, at the time of the apostles, uh, the time of Jesus, there were there were f- pagan gods and there were there were false, you know, uh, gods and, and idolatry. But I wonder if man has ever been so arrogant, the, the sense that I am God, I don't need God, I don't need redemption, I don't need the precious blood of Jesus, I don't need the sacraments, I don't need Our Lady, uh, I don't need the Pope, I don't need authority, uh, I can do it all on my own. So this is the June 18th, 1965 message. It is the message of Our Lady that is communicated through St. Michael the Archangel. And I quote, As my message of October 18th has not been fulfilled and has not been made known to the world, I tell you that this is my last message. Before the cup was filling up, Now it is overflowing. Many cardinals, many bishops, and many priests are on the road to perdition and are taking many souls with them. Less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist. You should turn the wrath of God away from yourselves by your efforts. If you ask for his forgiveness with sincere hearts, he will forgive you. I, your mother, through the intercession of St. Michael, the archangel, ask you to amend your lives. You are now receiving the last warnings. I love you very much and do not want your condemnation. Pray to us with sincerity, and we will grant your requests. You should make more sacrifices. Meditate on the passion of Jesus. Now, this is such a hugely significant message. Let me also mention that uh, this was one reason why uh, there was disbelief in the authenticity of Garibaldal by certain local clergy and even uh, local bishops uh, of the region. Uh, They didn't appreciate the reference to many cardinals, bishops, priests being on the road of of perdition. Uh, By the way, in 1965, this is right uh, at the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council, and you have St. Paul VI come out with his uh, document on the Eucharist speaking about the new crisis in the church regarding disbelief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Uh, and that this had been promulgated uh, by uh, priests and even some bishops had, had taken this position. So we should respond with a gratitude and a belief, without judgment, it's not our call to make the judgment, but if you look at the Garibandal message in light of the Akita message in 1973, you see very clearly, Our Lady says, on October 13th, the anniversary of Fatima, cardinals will be opposing cardinals. Bishops will oppose bishops. Compromises will enter the church. And 
priestly confreres will be attacked by their uh, other priests. That is to say, uh, priests being true to the Eucharist and other elements of the faith will be attacked by others. So uh, this is not exclusive to Garib Mandal. Uh, it's a very important message. So where does this lead us all? It leads us to respond. It leads us to seek to do our part, perhaps more generous than before. Uh, I think the sobering nature of the Garabandal message, and again, the warning should be kept in relation to the miracle, which is in relation to this chastisement, which awaits us if we don't respond with greater generosity. Here's a mother saying, I love you very much. I don't want your condemnation. And again, realize she's, she's talking to eight billion people in one message. Some might say, and I've had people you know, question me about this in the past, so, well, I'm living as best I can. I, I go to the, you know, Mass each day. I'm, I'm, I do adoration things. It's a call for self-examination. She's not saying you're in danger of condemnation, but there are many who are. And so let's be fair to the mother's message and, and let's be grateful and perhaps let's respond like never before. Again, July 2nd is the anniversary of the Garabandal message. Perhaps um, we can do a re-examination of our own level of generosity, and perhaps we can pray the rosary more. Perhaps it's time to start going to daily Mass. Perhaps we want to up our visits to the Eucharist in reparation for the great denial, even among Catholics, of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Because the message of 1965 is all the more true today. And therefore, our need to respond to the message of Garabandal, which I certainly hold to be supernaturally uh, authentic, uh, as well as the overall Marian message to the modern world. I want to end by noting that when Conchita talked about the miracle, she said it would coincide with a great ecclesiastical event in the church. And in an interview, she said something like a dogma. So remember that to proclaim the truth about Our Lady, that she is the spiritual mother of all peoples, she is the mother who loves all of us, to proclaim this by the Vicar of Christ will bring historic graces into this situation, which can have a massive mitigating effect on a chastisement. According to Sister Agnes Sasagawa, the chastisement cannot be avoided, but it can be mitigated. So let's do our part. And I want to end by praying the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. I ask you to pray daily for Pope Francis, for his heart to proclaim the truth about Our Lady as the spiritual mother of all peoples, the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. And also to pray the prayer, which is inspired in a special way for this proclamation and a, and a prayer that I think is so uh, absolutely important for our present moment. And that's the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. I'm going to get a copy of the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. We're happy to send it to you free of charge. Uh, you can email us at mary at motherofallpeoples.com. Include your name and address and we'll send it out uh, to you. You should get it within a week. It's a powerful prayer. It should be prayed every day. And you can see it's a prayer for this time, particularly in light of the true facts, the true message of Garabandal. So let's pray together the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks. God bless you all.